Welcome everyone. My name is Lisa. Lisa, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. I don't know if it's just me, but you are muted. Uh oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I didn't want to interrupt you. And I also wanted to make sure it wasn't just me being the weak link in the tech chain, but um, you were muted. So I don't, uh -oh. do you, you, might, you might need to start again. I'm sorry. All right, I'm so sorry. I don't know how I got muted. I went from not being muted to being muted. Anyway, let me try that again. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I am Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. For those of you who may be new to Gray Muzzle, we provide funding and other resources to animal welfare organizations across the country. We're actually getting ready next month to announce our 2022 grant awards. We also provide resources to the public. This webinar is part of our monthly series, um, and we are delighted to have Dr. Julie Busby here talking about canine vestibular disease. So she will be taking questions at the end. Please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box if you are joining us on Zoom, or if you are joining on, us on Facebook Live, you can put your questions in the comment box and um, we will I'll try to get to all of the questions that come in. So let me introduce Dr. Julie Busby. She is an integrative veterinarian and she seeks to blend the best of Western medicine, alternative therapies, and creative tools for maximum wellness in her patients, the majority of whom have gray muscles. After years of frustration watching her patients struggle on hard floors, she developed Dr. Busby's toe grips for dogs assistive devices which enable instant traction and confident mobility. Dr. Busby is passionate about educating clients on a multimodal approach to improving the quality of lives for senior and special needs dogs. And she is a wonderful presenter and an even greater human. And we are just really delighted to have you here with us today, Dr. Busby. So I will hand the, the floor over to you and thank you again for joining us today and thanks to everybody out there tuning in. It is my pleasure. Thank you for that introduction. I am honored to be on the advisory board of the Gray Muzzle. I'm honored to contribute in some minuscule way to the work that this organization does. And I'm really excited to present this topic, canine vestibular disease. We're gonna be breaking down those words today a common senior malady. And I always go back and forth between using the word common versus not uncommon. But the bottom line is it happens. And I guarantee that some of you listening today will be impacted by this condition. And I was just telling the ladies before we went live that I'm super excited because you being here and learning is going to save you a lot of tears, I hope and predict in the years to come. If you, um, whether it be this current dog that you live that you live with and love, or over the course of your lifetime, the dogs that you will have in the future, or even friends' dogs, I'm really glad to raise awareness on this condition. 
So what is canine vestibular disease? Well, it's akin to vertigo in people, and I'm sure everybody has heard that term. Vertigo is actually a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. It can be caused by a lot of different things. But interestingly enough, it has so many parallels with canine vestibular disease. I don't know if the veterinary purists who are writing the textbooks and teaching at veterinary schools would approve of us calling this condition doggy vertigo, but I do. Uh, use that term loosely because I think it allows people to really get a good handle on what's going on. And I think you'll see that as we go through the presentation. But in so many ways, it's like um, canine vestibular disease. So vertigo can happen at any age, but it's more common in people over 65, just like canine vestibular disease, which is typically a senior dog issue. Nearly 40% of all Americans in their lifetime will experience vertigo. So probably a lot of you who are with us today have experienced it. And um, it's, like I said, it's the same for dogs. I'm gonna call it either common or not uncommon. We see it, it's not some weirdo thing that you know I've seen twice in my 25 year career. Uh, vertigo in people can last seconds, minutes, hours, days, even weeks. And that's similar to canine vestibular disease in that it typically runs its course. And over the course of a few days, maybe a maximum, really unusual, but a maximum of four weeks or so, it will resolve, which is a great thing. And there's not really a specific treatment for vertigo. We manage it and it's very similar in canine vestibular disease. So people with vertigo typically describe it as feeling like the world is spinning. They might feel like they're swaying, they're unbalanced, they're sort of pulled in one direction. Other symptoms that people describe are that they're nauseous. And you can, if you've ever been on the tilt-a-whirl at an amusement park, you understand why when you're spinning, you feel nauseous. And then this abnormal jerky eye movement, which uh, we're gonna talk about, and I have some videos to show you that's called nystagmus. And people also describe headaches and ringing in the ears. The scientific name for that is tinnitus or hearing loss. So we don't really know about dogs and headaches ringing in the ears, but I think we could extrapolate and say that just based on the location of where the disease happens, that that may be happening for these dogs too, because it's all happening, both conditions, the human counterpart and canine vestibular disease are happening in the vestibular system, which is predominantly in that inner ear. So this is a sensory organ that is providing input to the brain and it's feeding information on motion and position and orientation. If you think about it, it's like a miracle that we can get out of bed, stay upright against gravity, walk, walk downstairs, and then you take it to the extreme of, you know, the Olympic gymnast doing what they do. But the idea of how do we stay upright and know where we are spatially oriented is all the vestibular system. And so it's gonna affect balance, it's gonna affect posture, it's gonna affect gait, the way an animal moves. And in a nutshell, it's responsible for maintaining equilibrium. I couldn't find a slide like this or an illustration like this for dogs. So this is a people one. And I wanna draw your attention to the bottom left-hand corner where we have an ear and we have the external ear canal leading down into the uh, middle and, and eventually inner ear. And if you look at um, the inset directly above the picture that has the ear on it, that's kind of a blown up version of this uh, vestibular labyrinth. And it's really fascinating. Those, those kind of loops are three different structures that allow orientation in three different planes. So one of them is responsible for the up and down, like when you're nodding, yes. So motion in that plane. Another is responsible for the motion of shaking your head back and forth, like no, the motion in that plane. And then the third is a head tilt where your ear actually gets closer to your shoulder in one direction or the other. And so one of those loops is responsible for the motion in that plane. And they're filled with a liquid called um, endolymph, which cracks me up. It seems like, you know, something out of Lord of the Rings. So you've got endolymph circulating in these loops and where you see kind of the bulbous, round, bigger purple circles at the end of the loops, those are the ampulla or ampullae, plural. And those are structures where the fluid from the, the endolymph comes in. It actually will vibrate hairs in the ampulla 
And the hairs then create neurotransmitters, which then feed information right to the brain. It's like super high tech. Then you've got the bigger structures there. You can see in the diagram, the utricle and the saccule, and they allow for orientation in, in um, the horizontal and vertical plane, and also provide more information for the body spatially with respect to gravity. So probably more than you wanted to know, but it's a really intricate system all attached to the cochlea. I'm sure you've heard of the cochlea, the cochlear implants that um, hearing impaired people may receive. The cochlea is related to hearing. And over on the right, you've got a picture of one of the potential causes of um, vertigo. There's a lot of causes, but one of them is these little crystals. There are calcium carbonate crystals, which can get kind of shifted and impact the hairs below. And that is thought to be one of the causes of vertigo. And if you've ever heard of someone going to a chiropractor for this maneuver to help them with vertigo, it's to sort of reorient those crystals. So back to what I said at the very beginning, this is one of my favorite conditions to diagnose in veterinary medicine. And I talked about it in a blog um, years ago on the Gray Mesel website. I have the URL, URL at the bottom. But in the blog, I described this 13 year old um, blue healer who had come in with her mom, whom I knew because my first job, I was a uh, mixed animal vet. So I saw dogs and cats in the clinic and I saw um, mostly horses on farm calls. And so I knew this family as a farm call family and they were just like pioneer tough, right? I mean, they were just tough. And so to see this woman come in with Foxy, this blue healer just sobbing her eyeballs out broke my heart. I mean, it always breaks, breaks my heart, but this lady, like she was just broken. And so she comes in with this dog and she's sobbing because she's got a 13 year old dog who looks like she's already got three paws in the grave and she's just assuming she's not going to go home with that dog that day. Like that is a foregone conclusion in her mind. And I've been a vet 25 years, as I mentioned earlier, I've seen a fair number of these cases and it's, um, I almost have to like contain my glee when these dogs come in because the people are so distraught and I'm so happy because for the most part, and we're going to talk about some other conditions that don't carry as good a prognosis as this one does. But for the most part, we end up with a really happy ending. And I can sort of foresee all of that. And um, I just need to kind of get the people calm down and be able to talk through it. And they're typically shocked. And that's why I said, I'm so happy that you're here. You're learning about this. We're raising awareness, not only for your dogs, but for the dogs of your circle who you, whom you know and love and it's a senior dog issue and you know our hearts are for the senior dogs so i'm excited because i love nothing more as a veterinarian than providing genuine hope and this is the, the hallmark disease to do it so this is how they come in this is actually a picture of a dog with idiopathic vestibular disease i asked my colleagues this week and putting my the final touches on my slides i said hey does anybody have video or picture that you can send me for my slides and I got a few, which I'll be showing you, and I'm excited about this, but this is a 17, yes, I repeat, 17-year-old golden retriever, God bless her, and um, she's in the hospital right now for vestibular disease, and these dogs have a head tilt. I'm going to get into the full list of symptoms, but suffice it to say, you know, their head's tilted, they're walking like a drunken sailor, they're not eating, they just look horrific. In the South, we use the word puny. These dogs just look puny. Okay, so idiopathic canine vestibular disease. I wanna break down those words um, and also the synonyms. It goes by a lot of different terms and I, this is not an all incl inclusive list that I have at the bottom of my AKA, also known as old dog vestibular disease, canine geriatric vestibular disease, old dog syndrome, I've heard it called. So. Breaking down the pieces of those words, obviously it's canine or dog. I have read that cats can rarely get it. I have never seen a cat with it, but apparently they can. Vestibular, hopefully we've covered enough ground on that. So you know why it's called vestibular because it has to do with that vestibular um, area of the body and the inner ear, the vestibular apparatus. And then idiopathic, we joked in vet school is a fancy word that means your vet's an idiot. I say that lovingly, of course. But idiopathic is the fancy word that means we don't know why. We don't know why this happens. 
there are some thoughts, but ultimately it's this syndrome where there's disease process that happens and God willing resolves. That's what we always hope for. And in the classic presentation, if it's, if it is this diagnosis, it will resolve. And we don't know why we don't have an underlying reason that we can pinpoint. So what are the symptoms for these dogs? So I'm going to show you some videos and illustrate these, but again, I described the drunken sailor walk. The, the veterinary term for that is ataxia. They just don't have balance, which causes them abnormal posture, often a wide base stance where their paws are like out in front of them much wider than normal because they're just trying to gain their bearing it, it, by having a wide base stance. It just gives them a little bit more support. A head tilt is very common. A head tilt, remember I described the ear is closer to the shoulder in a person. Their ear is closer to their body too. A head tilt and the nystagmus is the hallmark. That is that fast flick, rapid eye motion. I have personally never diagnosed a vestibular dog, uh, any cause of vestibular disease in a dog that didn't have this nystagmus component. It's classic. There are three different types of nystagmus. Horizontal, where things are going side to side vertical where they're going up and down and then rotary where the eyes look like an old telephone where you would dial in a circle and they're doing that but it's this repetitive motion and we can even get some idea diagnostically based on the type of nystagmus that the dog has okay so this is a 13 year old beagle with vestibular disease and this dog's actually hospitalized this dog's reasonably stable but you'll i want to show you the gait of a dog with ataxia so this isn't terribly severe, but as she starts walking towards the filmer who has food for her, she actually goes, I think on purpose over by the cabinets that you're seeing, the drawers that you're seeing on the left-hand part of this, this screen, because I think being up against a wall provides again, more stability, more, more of a safety net if she would fall. And I think she chooses that on purpose. Muncie. Good girl. And now we're going to look at nystagmus in this dog. This is the rapid eye motion. The eyes have it. As I said earlier, if you um, one day suspect that your dog has this issue, really you want to just gently cup their chin and look into their eyes, just like this picture illustrates, and watch for rapid eye motion like this. So that's an involuntary motion where the eyes are just constantly scrolling back upward. Um, and I'm going to show you this dog does not have um, idiopathic vestibular disease. I want to show you this video of um, uh, horizontal nystagmus side to side, which is the most common, I would say, with this condition. But this is a this dog has a whole different diagnosis. A, a colleague of mine wrote this up for me. And the history of the dog's mom was do dropped off at the shelter pregnant. She had a litter. A couple of the pups were not right. This dog was the most affected. A veterinary colleague of mine adopted this dog. And this video was just taken this week. So this is the dog's life. Um, she's doing fine. She's not on any medications. She has a condition called hydrocephalus. So fluid on the brain. If you think of those apple-headed chihuahuas that have this, they not not all apple-headed chihuahuas, don't get me wrong, I love chihuahuas, but this can be something they are more prone to, fluid on the brain, and this, in this case, caused um, nystagmus for this dog, but she's doing great. So another happy ending story, even though she's got some little quirks. Uh, okay. So hopefully you can see that just, it's like a typewriter. The, the eyes move quickly and then reset back, reset, move quickly and reset and it's just repetitive. So how do we diagnose this? Well, step one is a thorough physical exam. And I, a physical exam is, the, is step one of anything that um, an animal is presenting with because they can't speak for themselves. Certainly getting a history from the family and finding out what's, you know, what was, what might have preceded this is valuable and it is valuable in this case. I mean, that's also something that's really hard for the pet parents to understand because like in Foxy's case, the lady's telling me she was fine yesterday. Like she just woke up like this. 
I don't understand. Like how did, how, you know, I, did she have a stroke? I don't understand how she could go from perfect to looking this bad in a matter of hours or my dog went out back in the yard and she was fine at four and now it's 630 and the dog looks like this. That's actually part of the disease process is this acute onset, very sudden. So we do a full physical exam. We do a full neurologic exam. And interestingly enough, this idiopathic vestibular disease that we're talking about, it affects the peripheral vestibular system in the inner ear that we talked about, as opposed to central vestibular disease, which is coming from the brain. All the sensory uh, input from the, the inner ear apparatus feeds into the brain. So there's multiple stops along the pathway for the body to be able to respond appropriately. And so things can go wrong in the brain as well, called central vestibular disease, and that can manifest um, with symptoms. We'll talk about that too. But with peripheral disease, which is by definition, this type of disease, idiopathic vestibular disease, we don't see mental deficits. I mean, obviously the dog may be a little depressed that they feel terrible and just look sick, but they're not gonna act comatose. They're not going to act like they don't recognize you. They will not have proprioceptive deficits. And I'm going to define that in the next slide. And they're not weak. Like they basically, like you saw in that beagle, they can walk. It's not like they're collapsing, their back end's going out from under them. They're just dizzy, if you will. So basically the equilibrium is off, but the dog is basically still functioning otherwise. So this, I recorded this video for a different blog on intervertebral disc disease in dogs, back disease, because one of the first things I'm checking for a dog with back disease is their conscious proprioception. So I thought I would throw it in here, bonus material, because this is just a good basic test that you can learn to do at home. Essentially, you would just have your dog standing. You're gonna need to support the dog. So for a bigger dog, it might even be a two person test because the dog's dizzy and wobbly. And so somebody needs to just support the dog so he or she stays on their feet. And then the other person's just turning over the paws and seeing if they immediately replace. The dog should not leave the paw knuckled over. And I will just let the video do the talking now, sorry. Testing conscious proprioception is important in knowing that the dog understands where the feet are in space. So all we do is simply take the paw. If the dog is non-weight bearing, you need to support the dog by putting a hand under the belly or resting the dog on your knee in some way. This is a small dog who's perfectly fine. And all we do is take the paw and flip it over into a knuckled position and the dog should immediately replace the foot into a normal position like you're seeing here. For a dog that has neurologic issues, they can be very slow to replace the foot or not replace it at all. We call that knuckling. But this is a good test to understand how to do at home. It's really important that um, this is, is normal. And when we start to see this slow or not be normal, and I always repeat it multiple times before drawing a conclusion, when we start to see this slow or not be normal, that's the first sign often of a neurologic issue. Okay, so that test in dogs with back disease you want it to be normal. If it's not normal, that helps us know prognostically how significant things are, um, how far, far affected the neurologic system is. But in dogs with vestibular disease, again, as long as you're supporting the dog and they are upright and are in a position that they can replace it, they should be doing so. If you flip the paw and the dog just left the paw um, flipped on the knuckle, you know, right, wrong side down, that would worry, and I repeated that several times, not just once. I would want to repeat that and make sure it was a repeatable results. That would worry me about central disease, something happening within the brain itself, which is a different ball game than what we're talking about, peripheral disease, and um, is by definition the type that idiopathic vestibular disease is. All right, so there are other conditions that can manifest with vestibular symptoms. These include infections of the inner ear, the middle ear of the brain, rickettsial disease. That's typically, um, there's other categories, but I think of that as uh, tick-borne disease in this case. So different types of tick diseases. I have had one case where the dog presented like this. We tested the dog, the dog was positive um, for Lyme and the dog resolved on um, doxycycline. So then we say, well, 
was it actually idiopathic vestibular disease and he was going to resolve anyway, or was it the doxycycline? I don't know, but the dog got better. And rickettsial disease certainly can be a rule out causing vestibular issues. Unfortunately, cancers, a brain tumor, something we always worry about when we see senior dogs more commonly than younger dogs with cancers, that's on the rule out list. Toxins, even drugs. Um, rarely, one of my favorite drugs of all time, so don't take this as me knocking the drug, but metronidazole, also known as Flagyl. I love that medication. I've used it a ton over my career, although it's falling out of favor in, in recent years for um, diarrhea in dogs. But in any case, it, it, it has been known rarely to cause vestibular disease. And then, of course, trauma. I mean, if you end up with a, you know, a traumatic brain injury, it can cause vestibular symptoms. So in general, when I'm in the exam room looking at these dogs, I can get so much information from the history, from my physical exam, and from my neurologic exam. And I feel comfortable making a presumptive diagnosis in the exam room of this condition without advanced imaging, which is nice because some diseases are more expensive or issues that dogs present with are much more expensive than others to diagnose. And this is one that usually just by an exam, I'm, I've got a pretty good idea of what's going, you know, what's happening and what kind of information and prognosis I can present to the owner. I always inform them of this list, go through the list and say, you know, there's no guarantees. There certainly could be other things going on, but we have a saying that I learned in vet school. When you see um, hoof prints, don't go looking for the zebras, just look for the horses. So this would be the horse, the more common issue, but it couldn't, it certainly could be something else. I can't ever say, I can never give a conclusive 100%. This diagnosis is old dog vestibular disease just on an exam. I would need advanced imaging, a CT scan or an MRI, which of course is under anesthesia to rule out other conditions to then sort of come to this diagnosis as a diagnosis of exclusion. But I often just, especially if the um, pet parents are willing and this is the direction that they wish to go, if they want to go further, absolutely, I'm happy to refer and get them um, as deep into the diagnostic process as they wish. I mean, I want them to be in the driver's seat. I, my job is to present the options. But if they say like, well, either finances are an issue or we're willing to just start with conservative and see how things go for a few days, I think that's reasonable because this disease is not going to progress. It's typically as bad as it's going to get when you notice it. And over the days ahead, it's going to get better, not worse. And so I think we can use that as that kind of timeline to sort of support our diagnosis, if you will. So even that said, I typically will do what we call a minimum database, which is blood work. And usually I'm going to run urine with blood work just to check for tick-borne disease and also check thyroid because in some dogs, there's this kind of obscure link before vesti between vestibular disease and hypothyroidism. So I'm always checking thyroid as well in these patients. So how do we treat them? Well, it's a little tricky because it's idiopathic. We don't even know what caused it. So how do you treat it? And that's why there's not a specific cure, just like we talked about for vertigo, we're managing it. One question is, do we manage it inpatient versus outpatient? Both of the dogs that I showed you in the videos, they were inpatient cases. Those dogs were hospitalized for treatment because um, they can get dehydrated from vomiting. And so we often do IV fluids. But if I have a really on the ball um, dog mom, who's like, I got this, you know, I can do sub Q fluids at home. And I know they're going to give the dog round the clock TLC. I don't mind sending these dogs home. It's a case by case decision. I have done acupuncture and chiropractic on these cases over the years. And this is only my experience. I'm certified in both. And so I don't want to say, you know, these don't work because in other people's hands, maybe they do. And I have heard colleagues talk about having some limited success with acupuncture, but in my hands, the cases that I've done acupuncture and chiropractic on, I've not had it been the, you know, instant miracle cure for this condition. So again, it's supportive care. It's TLC. It's making sure the dirt dog doesn't fall, going to the bathroom. I mean, just like basic nursing care. And then we do use anti-nausea medicine, which helps improve appetite and motion sickness medicine, 
Um, meclizine is the one I typically use. It's known as antivert. Um, people have used dramamine, and I do actually think that that helps. It's an antihistamine, interestingly enough. So one of the big things we always get concerned when our dogs aren't eating, we have a blog on our website on how to help uh, support nutrition for a dog with vestibular disease. And I'll show you that link in a little bit, but you want to support the dog when lying down. I have never seen this, but I have read in the literature of dogs whose vestibular system was so off that the dog literally would just keep rolling. So they're laying down and they're so dizzy that they're rolling over and they just keep rolling and rolling and rolling. So we wanna support them even when they're lying down, I'm thinking like a bolster bed or pillows around them so that they feel support and they don't feel just kind of like dizzy and unable to be in control of their body spatially and just be left out there in space to deal with it. We wanna give them a snug place. Also again, and when they're standing, offer support if they prefer to eat standing, definitely support them. There's great slings on the market for that. I love the help them up harness for a real complete total body support for less support. There's the ginger lead, which I love. And those are both fantastic. One of the reasons these dogs don't eat and drinks because they can't get to their food and water bowl. So just again, part of the TLC, bringing that to them and supporting them is really important. Providing good traction. We don't want these dogs slipping and falling when they're eating or walking. And we're gonna talk about uh, that at the end because I have a solution for that. And then we want to make the food more appetizing for any sick dog. We want to make the food more appetizing. So there are, like I said, better living through chemistry. There are drugs that we now use that are great for appetite stimulants, but you can make the food more appetizing. A general rule of thumb is a dog who's not eating, eating, whether it be because of a condition like this or just kind of end stage age where they're just failing and they don't have a great appetite. They like gamey type foods. So venison, tripe, that seems to be, if you add gamey foods into their diet, that seems to perk their appetite and smell. We know that if any of you also have cats, sick cats don't eat because they can't smell. So cats with an upper respiratory, it's really critical to clean their nose and get them smelling again to get them eating. You can uh, warm food up a little bit. It helps to produce, um, you know, the the odors, the molecules were, will aerosolize. So making it more odiferous for the dog, making the food more appetizing is important. All right, I put this slide in here to remind me to tell you that even once the condition's totally resolved and the dog looks great, it's all behind you and like, hallelujah, you know, we're, we're out of the woods. Often these dogs will be left with a residual head tilt. So even after the, the whole thing's over, this can be something that never resolves and that they have for the rest of their life. But I also wanted to share this interesting story of Sadie. She was a nine-year-old German Shepherd. She was hypothyroid. I already knew that in advance. I had diagnosed that and she was well controlled on blood work and, and taking her medications. And she, her parents rushed her in because the dad had left at 2.30, she was fine. This is what I, one of those things I referred to earlier. Mom comes home from work at four and she has vestibular uh, symptoms. She's ataxic. She can't get up on her own. She has a head tilt. She's got the nice stagmus. So they rush her into me and I do a complete physical exam, a neurologic exam. And um, she was nine. So senior-ish for a large breed dog. And I, I did an otoscopic exam. I didn't see anything in the external ears. Granted, this is a middle to inner ear condition. And so you can't necessarily just because the external ear looks perfect doesn't rule that out. However, usually there's some history of ear disease, uh, ear infections, and something going on in the external ear, most commonly if you're gonna have inner and middle ear disease. So again, can't perfectly rule it out, but I didn't see anything in the ears. So I presumptively, and she said, you know, owner said, we can't do anything more. You know, we're gonna do the best we can at this point. I presumptively diagnosed this condition but the, the reason I, I share the story is because the craziest thing happened. The next morning they called me, I, I let her go home. Um, she had two very capable parents who were gonna give her all the care she needed. And because it was so acute, she wasn't dehydrated. They were gonna work to keep her eating and drinking. And the plan was they were gonna bring her back the next day. We were gonna reassess to, to see if she needed hospitalization. So they called the next morning when they were supposed to call and give a check-in as to whether or not um, 
you know, I, what we were going to do for the recheck exam. And they said she was 100% normal, like perfect. No head tilt, no nystagmus, no nothing. So I did take that to my veterinary colleague gurus and said, you know, who has ever heard of this? Like, this is so bizarre. And the consensus was really strange, typically doesn't resolve that fast. I mean, that was less than 24 hours. But if it didn't come back again, then it probably was the right diagnosis, that idiopathic, we don't know. Canine vestibular disease, if it came back again, then we needed to be worried and look for something more. Never came back again in the years that I was her vet, never came back again. So a crazy story and just interesting on the timeline that it can last from, according to Sadie, mere hours all the way to the longest that I've seen and the longest I think I've seen in the literature, four weeks. These can recur. I'm sure that's going to be a question. It's a question that I had learning about this. Um, they can recur. You can have a dog have this more than one time in their life. However, that's rare. Typically, it's kind of this once and done thing, and they rarely recur in a, in a short time. So if your dog has it, they kind of get over it in a few days, and then six days later, they have it again. That would really worry me for something more significant and different going on. The main message I wanted to share and why I wanted to talk about this topic of all topics in this webinar is stay positive, have hope. This condition is one of the ones you want for your dog. If you have to have a condition, if your senior dog has to have an issue, this is the one you want. So just to recap, there's this sudden onset that's classic. The symptoms are non-progressive. So I mean, maybe within the first hours of noticing it, things can get better before they get worse, but over days, they are not continuing to get better. They are actually either staying the same or slowly improving. Most dogs do improve within the first three days. They're on the right track. Granted, the full recovery, and I put full in quotes because I warned you the head tilt can be residual forever, but full recovery can take weeks, but they're at least on the right track early on. They're not hospitalized for weeks. In the worst case scenario, they're hospitalized for days. So this is our blog and my website, toegrips.com. You can see it at the bottom and forward slash blog will take you to our blog. If I can just brag, I'm on my team. I'm so proud of our blog. Um, I started out writing all these blogs and realized that I wanted, that like this was a goal for me to put out high quality, information not everything on dr google as you probably have figured out is good information um i was mortified that there's like six thousand views a month on how to euthanize your dog with benadryl like there's bad stuff on the internet and so i said we're gonna be a beacon of light for good quality veterinary information and so over the years, I've hired an amazing team of veterinarians who work and write with me, our whole team, from the editor to the photo editor to the proofreader, they're all veterinarians. And so um, I, we have high quality information and kudos to my amazing team. So the ones that I think would pertain here, we have a blog on how to feed. I mentioned that earlier. We have a really cool blog done by um, a physical therapist. She's a master's, I think, or a PhD. She's like very qualified physical therapist, human but her practice is animal. And so she did 10 tips and exercises for dogs with vestibular disease. It's really cool information. It helped me help my patients a ton. My story about vestibular disease, um, basically I use the term doggy vertigo. There's an article on hypothyroidism. I mentioned the potential link. I told you that some, sometimes it's called old dog syndrome. So we did write an article under that title to help people who are searching for that find us. We publish twice a week. Very soon, we're going to three times a week. And I'm, assume, I'm assuming you're here because you have or love senior dogs and it's all really senior dog focused. All right, so let's say your dog has this condition and you're pretty sure it is this condition. Your vet has diagnosed that, but it's just taking a long time for your dog to kind of get back to where you want things to be. Don't hesitate to reach out to a rehab vet. Rehabilitation, that aspect of veterinary medicine is the fastest growing aspect of veterinary of small animal vet med. I love it. I put the website at the bottom. There's a tab on the navigation bar where you can find, like it's for the, it says for the public, you can find a vet near you. And these guys are amazing in terms of helping you with home exercises, um, maybe putting the dog in the underwater treadmill where the water is supporting the weight. But senior dogs in general, I think, can really benefit from rehab. Toe grips. If your dog is slipping, 
Um, any senior dog, certainly, but for this condition, we have plenty of testimonials about dogs that were diagnosed with vestibular disease. They were unstable in their home. That's very scary for dogs that if it really affects their confidence as well as their safety. And so toe grips are our uh, flagship product. They're non-slip nail grips that go on dogs' toenails, just super simple, minimally obtrusive to give dogs traction on hard, hard surface floors. And so I wanted to offer um, just a code gray22 um, for you guys for attending and thank you for being here. It's 10% off actually site wide for the rest of the month and you can go to toegrips.com and shop now. Again, the message that I wanna provide in this webinar is really for all of you who may have seen your dogs, who are getting up in the middle of the night with them, who are, maybe you have your own sore back because you've spent too much time lifting and helping your own dog. So really wherever you are in your stage of, of pet care, but certainly for this condition, idiopathic vestibular disease, just wanna offer hope that brighter days are ahead. And with that, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Busby. That was terrific. Um, I'm sure that that will really um, help people in the future. And we just really appreciate your sharing your knowledge. We do have some questions. Um, Bridget asks about the um, distinction between step one being the physical exam and step two, the neurological the neurologic exam is step two always performed. Um, she said, my question is what is done in a neurologic exam? I don't remember my dog having more than a physical exam when he had um, vestibular disease. Yeah, that's a great question. And any dog that's presented with any neurologic condition, your, your vet will do a neurologic exam but it may not have looked different to you because it's still sort of the same motions of hands on the dog. I mean, it probably all looked at, I wrote it down as two separate steps because personally I do it as two separate steps. I just do my tip to tail physical exam first. And then I go back and do the steps of a neurologic exam. That way in my mind, it's a specific pattern. I'm not missing anything, but not all vets I'm sure do it that way. The neurologic exam is essentially still hands on parts of the body of the dog kind of put sort of one, one thing would be the video I showed on conscious proprioception. That would be part of a neurologic exam and a vet could incorporate that into a physical exam, no problem. It doesn't really require any special tools, um, maybe a light to look for a pupillary light responses where they shine the light in the eye and make sure the pupils are constricted normally. Maybe, a, um, oh, what's it called? It's like a flexor or something. I never call it the right name. We just call it the little hammer. The thing that they use in human medicine, we use it in veterinary medicine too on the little stick. And it's got the orange rubber thing that they tap your knees for reflexes. That can be used as part of a neurologic exam to check reflexes. But yeah, I'm sure your vet did it and it was just all wrapped into one exam. And we have a couple of questions about toe grips, um, whether or not they ship to the UK. Are they edible? How do they attach? Well, can you talk a little bit about oh, I love I love talking about toe grips. So thank you for the questions. Um, we ship worldwide. We have shipped, we've been around for 10 years now, which is a crazy thing. Um, they were invented by one of my clients and I was like, these are game changing and he did not want to make them commercially available. So he very graciously said, if you can help dogs with these, Julie, go for it. And um, that has become really my life mission. I practice veterinary medicine part-time and this company is my full-time job. We ship worldwide. We've shipped to 55 countries or 54 countries, I think. So yes, we ship to the UK, but we have a distributor in the UK, uh, Orthopets UK, and you can look them up online. Um, they just attack, attach by creating a friction seal. That is my favorite thing about this product is it's so simple. It's so simple that people are like, these can't possibly work because they're so simple. Um, but that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, we always want the simplest and least obtrusive invasions, invasive solution possibly possible. So sized correctly, they basically just fit onto the tips of the dog's nails and create like a vacuum seal, seal on the nails. For, there are some cases where the dogs don't keep them on well and we use glue in those situations, like a dog who has proprioceptive defect, defects or deficits. Now that you guys have seen that video, you're all experts. So you can imagine if dog didn't have normal proprioception intended to drag or scuff the paws, that would pop off the toe grips. And so we use glue in those cases. And are they edible? 
So the answer to that is uh, nothing non-food based should ever be edible. But thank the Lord, we have never in 10 years had an issue with them causing any sort of an obstruction. They're small enough that they theoretically should pass right through. And that's always been the case. And they are FDA food grade, you know, certified non-toxic. Any other questions? Um, how do you trim nails with the toe grips? Um, so if anyone, I had talked about this before, actually, on a different webinar. If anybody's interested in nail trimming specifically, I know that's not the question, but if na nail trimming is a passion of mine, and I have a whole video course that you can, if you go to our website, you can link out and it's in the, on the product page when you click buy now. If anybody's interested in that, I'm happy to extend a code through the end of May to do my nail trimming course for free. Um, so you can write into our customer service and, um, you know, on the contact us page and say, hey, I went to the webinar. How can I get the free nail trimming course? And I'll give you a code for that. But the answer to the question is you remove the toe grips because they are removable. That's another beautiful thing. You trim the nails and you put them back on. And when you do that, inherently, it's like rotating car tires. The toe grips go on, you know, statistically, they're going to go on at a different place hitting the ground. And that's good because it extends their life a little bit too. Great. Um, Laura asks, can fainting, uh, quote unquote, or falling over occur while a dog is sitting upright with vestibular disease? So that's a whole nother condition. I would not consider that great question. These are great questions. I would not consider that part of the vestibular picture. Um, that's a whole nother thing we call fainting in dogs syncope. That's the veterinary term for it. And I would be more, um, there are some neurologic conditions. I just watched a video the other day from a colleague of a dachshund with narcolepsy. I had never seen that in a dog and it was insane. Apparently there's some genetic link um, to certain, with, in certain dachshunds, it was insane. So the dog literally just, it looked like the dog fainted. But I typically think about that with a heart condition. So the answer to your question is fainting or syncope is not a hallmark or I would not consider that a symptom in a vestibular picture. Okay. Um, Meg asks, can steroids like dexamethasone help with an episode? Another great question. I meant to talk about that. We don't, I will speak for myself. I don't use antibiotics or steroids um, in this condition. Um, at one point, I had actually seen in the literature that there was some thought that steroids were contraindicated, but this was old literature and things change on, it seems like on an hourly basis in the recommendations. So I do not recommend steroids, but if your vet, again, we don't know the underlying cause, it's idiopathic. So for some reason, if your vet had a reason to believe that there was an inflammatory underlying cause, then steroids would certainly be appropriate because they're the most powerful anti-inflammatories we have in our arsenal. Um, Valerie asks, do you have dog harness recommendations? A friend's very large Dane did have vestibular disease and it's challenging to potty a Dane you have to hold up. 1000% the help them up harness and I don't get anything for saying that. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, how, some, there's a question about how long do toe grips typically last? Another great question. So the average time is about eight weeks, so two months. Um, the span is one month to three months. And it really depends on the dog's size. You know, littler dogs just, there's less weight to wear on them. Uh, the dog's environment, or, you know, are they in the house? Or are they out walking on asphalt every day? And most importantly, the dog's gait. So a dog that's fairly normal gated, I had a golden retriever patient that basically had a, it was a senior dog, but gait was fairly normal, but she would slip and slide down their hardwood stairs. I only had to change her toe grips every four months, which was mind blowing to me. A dog, the dogs that really are hard on them are the dogs that have very abnormal gaits and either tend to drag them or, you know, really use them hard like a crutch when they're getting up. And that just wears them faster and you might only get a month out of them in that case, but they're also the dogs that are the most helped by them. So we really guarantee a month. I mean, if your toe grips aren't lasting you four weeks, we offer a 30 day money back guarantee under any circumstances, but um, that's one of them. Right. Um, we have another question. My question is, I have a 14 year old silk terrier chihuahua mix. Took her, I took her in because of her continuous circling. 
The vet said it might be vestibular disease. ER neurologist said she might have had a stroke. No MRI because of her age. What can be done for circling? That is a tough question because we, again, we don't really have a diagnosis and that would, you know, a, a stroke would need to be diagnosed with advanced imaging. Um, and I'm not one who we, I've got a couple blogs on this on our website. I am not one who says older dogs can't have anesthesia. I think older dogs absolutely can have anesthesia. And oftentimes it is critical to extending their life span and quality of life for dental disease, for example. In this situation, I'm not advocating anesthesia and diagnostics because I'm not sure that it changes things. Like I never wanna just do testing for academic reasons. Um, so what can be done for circling? Really the, the better question would be, you know, what is causing the circling and then treating that? Um, at, and again, I don't know the answers. The neurologist is gonna be your best bet. I would make another appointment with a neurologist for this because an exam is a very inexpensive test. So just going to see a specialist, typically it's gonna be between one, depending on the area of your country, of the country you're in. I mean, maybe the fee is between 125 and $300. I'm just throwing out some numbers. Um, but you get to pick that. Throws up. All right. Well, I think we lost you, Dr. Brown. Oh, pet parent. There you are. Sorry, you froze up for a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just, can you hear me? I was just saying that I think going to get a second opinion with a specialist is always a very good use of money because it's non-invasive. You're seeing a specialist. You can ask all your questions. And I think it's just a great way to get answers. So I'm sorry, I don't have better answers for what to do about circling, but my if it were my dog, step one would be go see another or the same or another neurologist for an appointment. And then in the meantime, just at home, be really careful with supportive care that the dog doesn't injure themselves. Um, we have a question about head tilt. My dog had two episodes of vestibular disease. The first episode lasted a week and the second lasted about an hour. At first, his head tilt was getting better, but then after the, the second episode, his head tilt got worse. Is there anything I can do to help decrease his head tilt? Absolutely nothing that I know of. Um, again, it may be worth seeing a vet rehab person for sort of the holistic whole picture strengthening of your dog, but I would not expect anybody to be any able to do anything, whether it be, you know, hands-on exercises at home or medication that would change that. The good news is it doesn't really seem to bother the dogs much at all. Right. Are you seeing questions that I'm missing? I am still not seeing the chat, unfortunately. So I'm just taking your feed. Oh, I, sorry. I was, I was um, wondering if Laura was um, seeing any sorry. that I have missed. No, that's okay. I know you, you have more than enough to do. You're doing a great job answering the questions. Um, we have lots of, of people saying thank you so much um, for the um, information. Some, uh, Dana was asking, could you please show the si slide on treatment options again? Few questions in the question and answer. So we'll circle back to those after you update to the slide. Is it this slide? I'm assuming. I think this is the only one that I had that talked yeah. about treatment. Um, we do have um, Wendy was talking about having a 16 and a half year old Jack Russell who since his attack last year seems to have lost his depth perception. So now rather than taking stairs down by each step, he jumps off the top step. Could okay. I now carry him downstairs, but could this be related? He is fine going upstairs. I would add he is also now blind in one eye. So definitely, um, you know, a trauma can affect nerves and other structures that can affect vision. So I, all that makes sense to me. And this can be very scary to dogs. So the first thing that I would do, 
I don't know if you're talking about inside the house or outside the house and maybe it doesn't matter, but I would be concerned about traction to make sure he doesn't feel um, there's not a loss of confidence going down the stairs. Down the stairs is harder than up the stairs for sure. Um, your gravity is, is pulling you down. And if you already feel frail or unstable, it's a little bit more intimidating. So the other thing that I love, this is a little vet hack, is to take um, tape, whether it be white or orange, reflective, glow in the dark, traction, you know, friction tape that has some grit to it, but tape the edges of every step. Again, I something bright. Um, and I have had patients in a similar situation, vision related, we're just showing them here's where every step ends by just putting tape on the edge across every step has really been a game changer for them. And then the other big thing is these dogs really struggle in dim light. So if uh, at, at in the evening, at night, certainly putting a, a night light or leaving the light on because adding a dim light to that problem is just gonna compound it. Um. Sharon asks if there are any dog breeds that are particularly susceptible. That is a great, that is a great question. And again, not something that I've ever personally felt or read in the literature, but certainly, as we said, it's an age related, you know, it's the, it's the age, but I've never seen a gender, um, you know, predilection or breed. Good question. You guys are on the ball. I've done a lot of... I've done a lot of these webinars, not on, this is my first on this topic, but over the years, I've done a lot. And I've got to say, these are the best questions I've ever had. Our gray oh, Russell supporters are top notch. Yes. Um, Laura, what, what questions have we missed? I saw a question in the question and answer that is asking for um, some advice on their senior dog was diagnosed with geriatric vestibular disease. He has an attack every couple of months but recovers quickly. Should I be worried that it is something more serious? Another fantastic question. Um, I mean, I guess the good news is that he recovers quickly. And the good news is that um, it sounds like the episodes aren't getting worse with time or more frequent with time. So it used to be that they were every three months. Now they're every six weeks. So, I mean, that still very possibly could be the diagnosis, but what I just said, if they seem to be getting more severe or more frequent, I would be worried. And I think it's at least worth having a conversation with your vet about, I don't know how many that you've had, but this can recur, this can be the diagnosis as it recurs, but the, as it starts recurring, the more my hackles go up to say, you know, what am I missing? What else is going on here? So. I think it's at least worth a conversation with your vet, but I still want you to sleep well because it could just be this. Perfect. I am not seeing any other questions that we haven't touched on. All right, well, and it looks like we're just up against the hour. So we will leave it there, but I just wanna say thank you so much, Dr. Busby, for sharing this terrific information. Like I said, we have lots and lots of comments saying thank you so much, this information is invaluable and I, I have no doubt that it, it will be useful to people going forward as they care for their senior dogs or um, non-senior dogs even. Um, so thank you very much for being here and sharing your knowledge and your, your passion for the topic and for senior dogs. It's my pleasure. Thank you for letting me be a part of Gray Muzzle. Yes, we are privileged to have you on our, on our advisory board, and we just thank you for all you do for, for senior dogs and animals in need. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, check out our website for more webinars. We'll have um, Dr. Mary Gardner presenting next month. and. We'll be sending out a link for everybody who registered in case you would like to watch the webinar again or share it with um, friends or family or colleagues. And please do complete the, the survey that we'll also send. We'd love to have your feedback and we welcome your ideas for other webinar topics. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye.